How's it going everyone? Ben here, your friendly neighborhood transgender medical student, and today we're going to be talking about whether or not binding can permanently affect your lungs. Because this is a question I get pretty often by people who do bind, and I have bind it for at least two years before I had top surgery. So I can also talk a little bit about my experience binding. If you don't know what chest binding is because you're curious on watching this video, chest binding is the act of wearing a compression vest on your chest as a transmasculine person to compress the chest enough for it to look more masculine. And I do not speak for all trans people. Some people may bind just because they want to. And a lot of masculine people don't bind at all because they feel comfort in their own skin and body. But for me, having a larger chest gave me a lot of dysphoria. So I resorted to chest binding to help alleviate my dysphoria about my chest. One of the biggest questions I do hear a lot from both trans and non-trans people who are curious about chest binding is whether or not it affects your lung function. And it's a very valid question to have because chest binding compresses the chest wall. And, you know, if you really think about it, theoretically, it could affect your lung function. And we've seen before chest binding became a common thing, a safer alternative to binding with ACE bandages. ACE bandages cause a lot of physical problems for transmasculine people using ACE bandages to compress their chest. There was a higher rate of bruising along the chest and even rib fractures were common with ACE bandages. So a lot of innovation on chest binding technology has come a long way over the years and luckily we don't resort to ACE bandages to bind our chest anymore. We wear binders made for trans bodies to help us with compressing our chest and give us some gender euphoria. Now, luckily there has been quite an extensive study on chest binding and its effects on physical health. Thanks to a project called the Binding Health Project that was established a few years ago, which was a cross-sectional study looking at transmasculine people and their physical health effects after years of binder usage and they were able to recruit about 1800 people for this study so that's quite a large number for a cross-sectional study that looked at varying ages of binder use and asked the participants about 27 common symptoms that they may have experienced while they were binding over the years. And they specifically looked at changes within the first year of binding and changes within 10 years of binding. Now you'll see in this study that within the first year, the most common symptoms that people experienced were back pain, chest pain, shoulder pain, itchiness, overheating, and shortness of breath. So only one of those symptoms within the first year that most people experience is lung related which is shortness of breath. And that makes sense because since the binder is compressing your chest wall, you're not able to expand your chest as much, your lungs aren't able to inflate as much, leading you to take shorter breaths to compensate for your regular breathing. So what does that actually mean like physiologically and clinically? How does shortness of breath affect your overall health? It does have some effects on how you go about your everyday physical activities. You'll notice that there are other symptoms listed on the study. I'll actually link to that entire study down below. But there's other symptoms that people may experience such as headaches and exhaustion and fatigue and tiredness. And that has a lot to do with shortness of breath as well because when you're breathing faster, you're more likely to get tired really quickly. You're less likely to be able to do aerobic exercise and you're more likely to get more tired easily. When I was binding, honestly, I did experience shortness of breath. It was one of the first symptoms I noticed when I started binding during my first week. I was like, wow, like I really feel like I am not able to expand my chest as much and take deep breaths. And I also noticed how it was starting to affect how I exercised. I got tired really quickly when I was going on my runs. So I did less aerobic exercise and started doing more strength chain training. I also realized because I was short of breath, my body was trying to compensate because I was getting hot faster and that lead, lead and that led to overheating. So a lot of these symptoms kind of 
align with one another. I will say I also experienced a lot of chest pain as soon as I took my binder off at the end of the day. I felt a lot of pain in my chest because of the fact that my bo my my body was being compressed so much by the binder. I will say that I never went over the recommended amount of hours for chest binding. I kept it to less than eight hours a day, which was the recommendation by my primary care provider and by the binder company that I bought my binder from, GC2B. And I always, always tried to take days off every now and then. If I wasn't going to see other people, if I wasn't gonna take pictures of myself, I did not have my binder on. The only time I put my binder on was when I was outside interacting with the outside world. I knew the consequences of binding for an extended amount of time, but I also outweighed the benefits versus costs when it came to my mental health and my gender dysphoria when it came to binding. So if you are going to bind, know that there are going to be risks and there are going to be symptoms that you are going to face, but that should not be anyone's reason to keep you from binding. It is a cost versus benefit scenario, especially because people like us don't have access to healthcare that allows us to get gender affirming surgery. And even in this study, the average age that people started binding was in their early 20s, around 21 years old. And if kids are able to access things like puberty blockers at a young age, where laws around the country right now are prohibiting, if kids had access to those things, they would be rest less reliant on things like binders that can affect our health as we get older and as we try to mitigate some of that gender dysphoria that we have. If we have easier and earlier access to trans health, we wouldn't have to rely on things like binders. But in the grand scheme of things, shortness of breath doesn't actually cause permanent lung damage. It just temporarily alters your lung function. So in the grand scheme of things, binding for the first year does not cause any form of lung damage. So when it comes to 10 year changes and things that are concerning when it comes to lung function in 10 years, we see that there is an increase of rib and spine changes from around 9% to 22%. So there's almost a 10% increase the longer you bind and something that you definitely should watch out for are rib fractures. That jumped from 2.3% to 6.6%. Luckily, that's not, not a huge increase. There was also a 10-year increase of respiratory infections from around 3% to up to 10%. So people tend to have respiratory infections more often when they have decreased lung function. So that's showing that for some people who have bind it for over 10 years, they did experience enough of a effect on their lung function where they became a little bit more prone to respiratory infections. However, there are some limitations in this study. The study did not control for things like smoking, things like taking care of someone's overall health. So that factor, so that number can actually be increased, not necessarily due to someone binding for 10 years, but because of other reasons and someone's overall health that increased their number of respiratory infections. Just something to be aware of. So overall, the big takeaways I took from this study is that binding doesn't necessarily cause significant permanent damage to how your lungs function. Even the increases we saw in the 10 years a lot of them weren't huge increases, and yes, some of them were a bit concerning, but we also need to address the confounding variables in the study that didn't take into account on how those numbers increased over 10 years. So the best thing someone can do who is trans masculine, who is binding, is to practice good binding practices. Take that break, don't wear your chest binder for 24 hours, take a break, let your chest relax, reestablish good posture, and take those rest days because they are very, very important for us to continue to bind and to continue to safely bind. And I'm hoping that one day, no trans masculine person who doesn't want to bind doesn't need to bind and they can get access to things like top surgery and access to hormone replacement therapy and access to all the things that they need so they don't have to rely on things like binding 
for over a decade. I just think it's ridiculous that there's people out there that have been binding for over a decade because they haven't had healthcare access for them to be able to get medical interventions so they don't have to bind anymore like top surgery. Anyways, I hope you found this video entertaining. I hope you found it helpful and I hope you will share this information with someone who may benefit from this information. I make this all available free and to the public to, um, I guess, consume. And thank you all so much for watching. Please follow me on Instagram and Twitter to keep up with my daily life and the advocacy work that I do and the shenanigans I get up to. And I'll see you on the next video. Mwah. This is Ben.